Hello and welcome. Tonight we're speaking about the philosophy of language. With me is Professor John Searle. Professor Searle has been teaching at the New University of California at Berkeley since 1959. Professor Searle, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, you've been a professor at the University of California at Berkeley for how well, many years now? Well, let's see, 50, I guess it's 53 years. I came here in 1959 and uh, it adds up. I've been a full-time professor here since then. Do you hold the old-time record? I think I do. I don't, you see, in the old days, people were forced to retire when they got to be 70 years old. Now, uh, they figured out that's unconstitutional. A bunch of old people in the Supreme Court figured if you can't fire people because they're black or female, you can't fire them because they're over the age of 70. Anyway, I can keep going indefinitely. So I, I, as they can't force me to retire and I'm having too much fun teaching, I'm not going to retire. Great. You're working on three books right now. Yes, I am, right. You plowed a lot of original ground on the philosophy of language, starting with speech acts. Yes, that was my first book. Now, another of your books, uh, many of your books, deal with consciousness and then the whole mind-body problem. Quote yes, quote. well, I got from language, I thought, well, my theory of language really makes heavy use of the mind because I see a per talking as performing intentional, goal-directed speech acts, and that means they got to have some mental content. So I thought I got to pay my dues someday and I'm going to write a book about the mind. And then I discovered there's a whole a, a garbage pit of bad philosophical views going on about the mind and I started getting debates about them. And that went on to a whole bunch of other books that I wrote about the mind. And then I got interested in society and I've written some books about society. What's the nature of society? The mind-body problem, it's not quite the same as the stomach digestion problem. No, it's not, but it ought to be. <laughs> that is, we have this we have two conflicting traditions, both of which are sources of confusion. One tradition says there's God, the soul, and immortality, and they're not part of the physical world. And there's another tradition that says science is materialistic, and there's no place in science for the mind. Now, I think both these traditions are mistaken. Uh, I think the mind is just a function of the brain. It's uh, the mental processes are processes that are produced by brain processes and they exist in the brain. So I like to make this boring analogy, roughly speaking, uh, the mind is to the brain as digestion is to the stomach. It's just something that, that uh, happens and it happens by natural biological processes. But we know all of those natural biological processes for the digestion in the stomach, but we cannot find or locate the part of the brain that generates what we call consciousness. Well, we're getting closer to that. I, I was in the president's decade of the brain in the 1990s, and we didn't solve the problems, but we got a lot closer. We know a whole lot more about the brain uh, than we did when I first got interested in these issues uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Still, you're right. We don't know how exactly the brain causes consciousness. Uh, we know quite a lot about specific processes like how the visual signal is processed from the time the photons hit the retina until it goes through all the parts of the brain and gets into the cortex. But how exactly do you get over the hump from neuron firings to consciousness? That's a fascinating question and we don't know the solution to that, at least not yet. But we're lots closer than we were. It, it's amazing to think that all of the various physical sensations that we experience uh, the taste of, of something or the, the sight or, or the feel of it. It's all neurons firing at different it's, frequencies. It is a stunning fact that the enormous variety, the incredible variety of our conscious life, everything from having a stomach ache to, I don't know, pick your favorite, feeling the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism, all of that is caused by variable rates of neuron firings relative to specific neuronal architectures. That's an amazing fact, but as far as we know, that's how it works. It seems that neuroscience is, is a field that's exciting all the sciences, the, the psychology yeah. uh, uh, sort of ends there and uh, philosophy uh, ends there and, and um, th there's a lot of uh, uh, interdisciplinary um, yeah. In the sciences right interest. now, that I mean outside of quantum mechanics and some and, uh, uh, cosmology, some exciting areas of physics, I think the most exciting area of the science right now is neuroscience because here is this incredibly complex mechanism 
And we don't know how it works, but we're finding out how it works. We're finding out how memories are laid down in your brain. We're even finding out why alcohol makes you drunk. Uh, I, so we've got all of this exciting areas of research going on, and we are making a lot of progress. However, as I said, uh, the big gulf, and we haven't solved it yet, is how exactly do neuron, neuron, neuronal processes cause consciousness? That's a beautiful question, um, and I hope it's solved in my lifetime. But uh, Excuse me, it may take longer. Do you, um, do you think it's a fair statement to call the brain the most complicated structure in the known universe? <laughs> well, people always say that, but you see, complexity always, is always relative to the assignment of some kind of criteria for judging complexity. Is the Amazon jungle uh, a complex? That's not really a fully meaningful question. And I think the, the problem with invoking complexity, the brain is complex, but for all we know, the mechanisms by which consciousness is produced in simple organisms may be simple mechanisms. And it may be that that's the key to understanding human consciousness. So if you think of uh, DNA and how it produces the enormous complex variety of human phenotypes, yes, they are incredibly complex and the processes are complex all the same. The structure of DNA is fairly simple and easily understandable. So there, there's a sort of feature of this discussion where people invoke complexity as kind of a magic term. They get dazzled by the incredible complexity of the brain. It is complex, but we, it doesn't follow from that that the mechanisms by which consciousness are, is produced uh, are themselves extremely complex mechanisms. There, for all we know, the lots of simple organisms may be uh, conscious, and if so, their consciousness may be produced by fairly simple mechanisms. Chomsky talked about discrete infinity. Yeah. Um, and uh, you see that in language. You see that from a, a very simple alphabet, you get the amazing, you yes. get Shakespeare. Right. From the Morse code, you get Shakespeare. Yes. Um, well, Chomsky's right about that, that we have a discrete set uh, of, and a finite set of devices, words, morphemes, and, the, and, the capa and rules for combining them, and that gives us an infinite capacity, and a capacity to generate an infinite number of different uh, sentences. And that's an extraordinary property of human languages. There's no limit to the number of new things that we can say. Would you say that that property is unique to language, or do you see it in biology? Well, do you I mean, see it in the DNA with yeah. a very limited number of base pairs. Yeah, you yeah. have all of the incredible... The, um, the capacity for infinite generative capacity is not confined to language. You can do it with, with DNA or all, all sorts of other combinatorial mechanisms. But what's interesting about um, language is not just that you have this infinite capacity. I mean, you could do that with infinite capacity, one, two, three, four, five. But you've got compositionality, that is to say, in addition to the generative feature, you've got the fact that you can figure out the meaning of the sentence just by knowing the meanings of the words and how they're combined in the sentence. So I think the generativity is exciting, but what makes it exciting is it's combined with composition. You understand the meaning of sentences you've never heard before just because you know the meanings of the parts and how they're, composed, how they're combined in the sentence. And intent? And the, well, you can, you see, they have to be produced with an intent, and what you do when you understand the sentence is you understand the intention behind its utterance. So this is the remarkable capacity of, about human language. Not only is we can co um, convey our intentional meanings to other people, but we can have all kinds of intentional meanings, all kinds of thought contents that we couldn't possibly have without language. So language doesn't just describe a pre-existing state of affairs, a pre-existing set of thoughts, but it enables us to have thoughts that we couldn't possibly have without language. It's like stepping stones to cognition. Well, it's more than just stepping stones. It is, a, it is a forms of cognition that are made possible by language that wouldn't be possible without it. So, for example, you can't do mathematics if you don't have a language. And indeed, now I introduce another element, that's writing. You really can't do complex mathematics unless you have a written language. And now, just to add something to that, much of our social reality, of the reality of money and property and government and marriage and universities and cocktail parties and television programs, that's created by language. Which kind of, Writing. Yeah, well, and, and well, especially written language. You can have simple forms of institutional reality. You can have uh, forms of private property and, and uh, simple uh, uh, governmental relations. 
but to have complex forms of the kind that we have. I mean, to think of our present presidential election. You cannot have that without written language. The, the phenomena are too complex to be conveyed just in an oral culture. Lasting commitments, marriage, yes, well, contracts. Okay. Uh, now, here is something that language gives us that no other animal has. We have forms of commitment that are carried by language that pre-linguistic animals cannot have. So, for example, a guy asked me to come uh, to downtown Berkeley uh, and have a television talk. And that gives me a reason for doing it, which is independent of my other inclinations. See, my dog is very intelligent, but he cannot make promises. He can't undertake those sorts of commitments. He cannot reason with obligations and operate with, with commitments of various kinds. So we've got not just infinite generative capacity and creative capacity for creating thought, but we create a social reality and we create a set of binding relationships among human beings. So I think in a way language is the glue that holds human civilization together because it creates all of these bonds, it creates all of these desire independent reasons for actions like obligations, commitments, requirements, duties, and all the rest of it. With all this power of language, there comes a danger too of becoming too abstract yeah. Uh, not keeping your feet on the ground, referring to referring to referring. Well, that's right. Um, and the problem with um, language, I like your metaphor of the feet on the ground, because it's very important to remember to stay close to the real world. And in my discipline, philosophy, there's always a temptation to go off into outer space, into hot air. And in fact, there are various movements that make a career out of that. There was something, you're probably not old enough to remember this, but there was something called postmodernism. Uh, and there, there was a lot of hot air where they said, well, maybe all of reality is created by language and everything is a text and so on. No, language has to stay close to reality uh, if it is to be fully meaningful and if its meaning is to be comprehensible. But, and this is what makes it fascinating, much of the reality that language has to stay close to is itself created by language. Uh, so the reality of government, the fact, the reality of the election that we're having, the reality of the candidacy and the voting, all of those are linguistic phenomena. They're created by language. And yet, in creating them, in creating, for example, the office of the presidency and in making a guy president of the United States, we use semantics to create a power, a set of powers that go beyond semantics. So this, uh, again, a remarkable property about language is that it serves to describe reality and we have to stay close to the uh, non-linguistic re reality that it describes, but it also creates a reality, the reality of instit what I call institutional facts like money and government and private property. It creates a reality which we can then go on to describe in objective terms. What about the dangers in our social reality of the abstraction of money and uh, uh, the way that it runs people and you know, well, it seems to be running the world, and it's right. like an abstraction that's gotten away from us. Uh, there are lots that we, of dangers. That we can't control. One is the powers that we create with these cognitive mechanisms can run out of control. And one of the fascinating things that happened in the past decade was uh, that the, uh, all my economists and friends have told me we'd never have another economic crisis like the 1930s because we know too much economics. Well, it turns out we didn't know so much. It got out of hand. And of course, a lot of people are now saying, well, I predicted that this was going to happen. Well, of course, I predicted that there was a housing bubble. Anybody could see that even in, in the city of Berkeley. But nobody quite was able to foresee what in fact happened or, or uh, uh, in fact get a, a correct uh, solution to the problems. So um, I, I don't want to give the idea that these institutional facts that we create with language are all sweetness and light. On the contrary, you can, just as you can create Democrats and Republicans, you can create communists and fascists. You can create all kinds of evil mechanisms using the linguistic devices. So the, our capacity to use language in all sorts of creative ways doesn't yet give us the moral constraints. Those have to be added uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, power of language. We have to uh, see how to constrain our use of language with morality and intelligence so it doesn't get out of hand. 
Do you think that it's a technology that we fully understand and enough to do The technology that? of language? Yes. No, I don't think it is. No, I, I think we're still working on it. Um, but we have made a lot of progress. Now, I, I think that some of that progress is going in the wrong direction. I mean, this isn't the time to go into a discussion of Chomsky's linguistics, but I think he neglects the fact that the sentences are used to perform speech acts, and a lot of the syntactical facts about what's, uh, what goes in a sentence and what doesn't go, those can only be explained if you understand how it's used. So we still don't have an adequate theory of the relation of structure and function in natural languages. There are lots of theories about structure, and I have tried to develop theories about function, but what I would like to see, and I'm not uh, enough of a syntactician to do this myself, is a serious analysis of the relationship between structure and function. I think that would be a fascinating study. See, here's the paradox of, of uh, Chomsky. I admire his work enormously, but he's had now more than 50 years, and there are no set of results that, competence, that uh, competent linguists are prepared to agree on. It's not like other sciences. See, in biology, we've got results that competent biologists agree on. That's not really true in linguistics. It's still divided into these warring factions. Do you agree with Chomsky that language is a facility that we innately have, like vision yes, I think, taste? Yes, I, I think that's right, that we have this ability. But that doesn't really say very much. There's a friend of mine, Dan Everett, who uh, found a language in the Amazon basin where he went and lived with those people for 30 years. And he found a language there that doesn't follow Chomsky's rules. Uh, Chomsky says that all language has to have recursive rules. And he says, I don't know who's right in this, but certainly he raises an interesting possibility that the Pitaha, that's the tribe he studies in the Amazon basin, they don't have these rules that have these mathematical properties that Chomsky described. They can't make relative clauses. They can't say, I met the man who knew my mother. They have to say, I met the man, the man knew my mother, but they can't make a relative clause. And that's just the fact about their language, is that they don't have recursion. I don't see why that's impossible, though, it was, uh, though it's a counterexample to Chomsky's views. I recall you mentioning once uh, something about uh, the sort of dualism that, that people tend to, to lapse into when they're thinking. You were describing um, your... Uh, Theories about uh, one philosopher, I think it was uh, Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein. Yes, Wittgenstein. thank you. Yeah. Um, you. You liked his early work, um, but you thought that it needed some some amending, or those ideas were incomplete. And someone, uh, another philosopher, said, "Well, then you must like the the second work." Yeah. And you said, "No, I, yeah. I I I just think the first work." needs, uh, uh, those ideas need some developing. Yeah. And I, it's just, it's something that, that I see all the time around me, is it, it seems like a, um, this sort of a, a binary dualism where it's like a, a, an excuse not to think. It's like if it's not communism, it's capitalism, or if it's yeah. not A, it's B, you know, or if it's not zero, it's one. Um, do you have any thoughts well, on that? Well, I, I think, in fact, there are valuable parts of both early Wittgenstein and later Wittgenstein. Uh, my own approach to language is really different from either of those. But still, Wittgenstein was one of the great philosophers of the 20th century. He made an enormous contradiction. The point you're making now is that we do tend to think in binary categories, good guys and bad guys. Uh, the people were for and the people were against. And of course, real life is much too complicated to make those categories. And I think part of what we try to teach people in education, particularly in education in philosophy, is to get a richer set of categories. And one, indeed, one of the things that you get of an education, which isn't really officially a very well marked, but it certainly is a mark of an educated person, and that is the ability to make subtle discriminations. So it isn't just good and bad, but there are all kinds of uh, nice ways of describing what exactly is good about it and what is bad about it. There's a kind of Manichaeism that pervades popular culture, and that we're all uh, victims of it. We think, well, the guys on our side, those are the good guys, and the guys on the other side, those are really the bad guys. Right. Yeah, and this really comes out especially strong in elections. The secret of successful democracies is it really shouldn't make too much difference who gets elected. I think life will, I mean, I happen to be for one candidate and not the other, but I recognize that for the most part, life will go on even if the other guys uh, get elected. Whereas the, your real 
dichotomy, people think, no, no, this would be the end of civilization as we know it if the bad guys get elected. In the case of democracies, that's not true. Successful democracies have to allow for genuine alternatives coming to power, and they re the reason for that is that the outcome of the election doesn't actually settle the major questions. Who's going to live and who's going to die? Who's going to be rich and who's going to be poor? You don't want those issues settled at elections. Do you think that um, we'd be better served with the proportional representation and uh, <sighs> multiple parties? And well, now we got, we're getting off the topic. Yeah, you're getting off the topic, but, yeah. but uh, no, I don't. I think what you want is a kind of stability. And in particular, in America, with this enormous complexity and pluralism and all these different factions and all these different traditions and cultures, it's very important uh, that you not just uh, uh, divide up the government of the country into a whole lot of quarreling factions, and the fact that the executive has to be controlled by one party or another forces us to have a two-party system. It forces all sorts of diverse groups to come together, and I think that's part of the unconscious genius of the American Constitution, is it forces us uh, to a kind of agreement that you wouldn't get in a, in a, a, a plural a system in, in a uh, well in a constitution in a, 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 a parliamentary type system. You know, to go back to panpsychism for a minute. Yeah. Uh, you, you you mentioned that you could see where it's attractive to people. Yeah. Um, I think of the many indigenous peoples that that felt like there was spirit everywhere and that, yeah. that was was well. Let me tell you exactly what's wrong with it. Panpsychism is the view that everything is conscious. Consciousness is everywhere. Uh, I'm reviewing a book for the New York Review where the author says, the universe is suffused with consciousness. Now, that is hot air, and I can tell you why people are tempted to it and why it's uh, nonsense. Uh, they're tempted to it because, as I said earlier, we don't know how the brain creates consciousness, and it's tempting to think, well, maybe it doesn't create consciousness. Maybe consciousness is there all, everywhere, like gravity. It's just everywhere is uh, pervaded with consciousness. And then we have little islands, or, or, or little pools of consciousness in our heads, but really consciousness is everywhere. Now, what's Without wrong the with? proof of that, isn't there a leap of logic on your part as well? Yeah, well, the, the, let me tell you what's incoherent yes. about that view. Consciousness comes in units. My consciousness is not the same as your consciousness, and they're not like adjoining puddles of mud that kind of leak into each other. No, there's a place where my consciousness ends and yours begins, and the pro all consciousness comes in units. Now, the problem with panpsychism is they can't say what the units are. See, I reviewed a guy who said, well, maybe thermostats are conscious. Why the thermostat? Why not each screw in the thermostat? The Why not the building? Why not the whole heating system? Why not the whole city? Is that Chalmers? And if you say, it, it was in fact, yeah. yeah. If, I, but if you then say, well, uh, uh, then uh, all of these are conscious, then what's the relationship between their consciousness? You see, if you say, my brain is clearly conscious, but suppose you say, but my, so is my thumb and my fingernail and each molecule in my stomach, what's the relation? between those consciousness and the consciousness of my brain. So the incoherence of panpsychism can be stated in one sentence. Consciousness comes in units, and the panpsychist cannot tell us what the units are. You know, on a spiritual level, I remember reading a philosopher, a couple different philosophers, talking about the de long development of sentience and, and our language ability. Yeah. And, and saying that, that, that this is when nature became aware of itself because it now had created a creature that could understand the existence of nature and talk about it and, yeah. and things like that. And, and my reaction to that was that it seemed uh, uh, anthropomorphic. Yes, um, it does. You know, yeah. I don't think that that's the yeah. nature became aware of itself yeah. when we became fully sensitive. Most consciousness in the universe is not self-aware. Most consciousness in the universe is in animals or fish or birds uh, that are not busy reflecting on themselves. Uh, their consciousness functions biologically to assist in their survival. But human consciousness, which allows for the consciousness of consciousness, that is, allows us to, for, for us to become conscious of our own conscious states and reflect on them, and indeed to reflect on our reflecting on those conscious states, as you and I are now doing. I doubt very much that that goes very far down the phylogenetic scale. As it happens, I'm a dog lover. 
uh, and I have a sequence of wonderful dogs. Uh, the, my favorite is the Bernese Mountain Dog. Now, these are intelligent dogs, but I know they're not busy reflecting on the nature of their own introspective capacities. They're mostly thinking about the cats they're going to chase and the bones that they're going to eat, and they don't have the, the time or the capacity to reflect on reflection. They're not thinking about what a good bone it was yesterday. Well, I, maybe they're thinking about that. I hope so. But they do not have this remarkable capacity that human consciousness have, and I think most of it we couldn't have without language, to have these second and third and fourth level consciousness where you have something that refers to referring and refers to referring to referring, and that's extremely sophisticated. It's not a feature of consciousness in general. Well, Professor Searle, we have a minute left. Um, would you like to talk about what you're working on now? Your yes, book? I'm writing three books, and the one I was working on today, which I think is very exciting, is Perception. Uh, and if you know anything about the history of philosophy, you know that the uh, subject of perception is a horrendous mess, mostly because of a mistake made in the 17th century that says, well, you never really perceive the real world. You only perceive your own experiences. And then you have to ask, how do you get from your experiences that you do perceive to the real world that you don't perceive? Is that Descartes? Or? Well, that's Descartes and Locke. And then yeah. it, the question was rejected by Barclay and Hume, who said, well, really, the real world just is your experiences. And that's another disaster. So what we have to do, I mean, the perception is exciting because we want to be able to explain how our perceptual apparatus is conscious and consists of these conscious states, but at the same time it gives us direct presentation of objects and states of affairs in the world. That's what I'm working on now. Two other books, one on language and another one on philosophy in general. I thought I'd write a general book about how to do philosophy. Good. Well, Professor Searle, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come talk to us. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. And thank you for watching. Good night.